On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are getting deep into our Picard primer with our review of The Next Generation's I, Borg, coming up next. Welcome to the Star Trek Universe Podcast. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. Oh, buddy. We're going to talk about iBorg, aren't we? Yeah, we are. I freaking love iBorg. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a great Star Trek episode. It's one that I really remember from my childhood, like really, really resonates with me. Um, I I mentioned on a previous cast that my way into this show was Geordi and Data, and this is a very Geordi-centric episode. Um, Love it. It I love it so much. It is a very Geordi centric episode, and I'm fine with that. It makes me happy. You know, it, <laughs> he said that as if other people wouldn't be fine with it. I guess I'm fine. I'm fi- you know what? I, I'm I'm okay with it being a Geordi centric yeah. episode. Like, who isn't okay with that? I feel like we needed more Geordi centric <laughs> episodes. Well, I, I said it that way because I, I was really happy to see that it was a Geordi. It was a very Geordi centric episode, and not a. Picard, not necessarily a Picard learns a valuable lesson episode, just because I, I want it to fit a little better with first contact. You know, I don't think this. Okay, we, we did talk about this a little bit on the phone when we watched this episode. Uh, mm-hmm. So the, the the lesson learned here is not that he's angry, although it is. Um, mm-hmm. in, in, in first contact, he learns a lesson that he hates the Borg so much that he's ready to do whatever he has to, and he won't give up his ship. He's like, he like won't let the Borg go any further. Uh, like he's, he's, he's learns a slightly different lesson in that, in that episode, in first contact, he learns that he is Ahab and the Borg is his whale. In this, mm-hmm. he learns the lesson that the Borg are people, which is a different lesson. Like I think, yeah. I think first contact is about him learning to get over his anger and be more logical in the face of this horror that is the Borg. Um, but in this episode, this episode is just very specifically about Hugh and the fact that once he's disconnected from the collective, even though he's still a Borg, he's a person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a different lesson. I don't, I don't think this conflicts with First Contact as much as you do. I, I That was actually my point. I, I don't think it does anymore. Oh, okay, great. Like, I, you know, specifically feel like it doesn't really have much to do with it at all like in fact this episode could inform a lot of picard's opinions in first contact yeah so yeah yeah for yeah. sure that's cool good 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 well i'm glad i'm yeah. glad you feel that way because I, I i was go- i was ready to f- defend this episode <laughs> that was a primary concern going in to the episode it was like oh, how much is this going to conflict <laughs> no nah, but it's really just about the character of hugh which, uh, you know, we're do- this is the Picard primer. We're getting ready for Picard. And this mm-hmm. episode is going to be, I think, a very key episode for Picard, uh, be- the series, because Hugh- we know Hugh is in it. Yeah. And it seems, I mean, he's been in the trailer a good bit, and I'm, I don't know, man, I'm pumped. I'm really pumped. I, this episode got me even more excited about Picard than I already was, and I'm already so so excited that I'm like, writing all these songs and like doing all these podcasts and like, I'm pumped, man. I'm so freaking pumped for Picard. And this episode got me even more there. Absolutely. Um, well let's break it down a little bit. Talk about this episode. Uh, we got, we have, uh, the crew of the enterprise finds a Borg, uh, left alone on a planet. All the other Borgs were killed in a Borg on his ship. All four were killed in a crash and he is left alone and he forges, uh, they, they bring him on board for humanitarian reasons because Crusher is, uh, is believes that they should save him. But it seems that Picard has an ulterior motive. He believes he can use him to p- send a virus back to the Borg and, uh, they go on to basically debate whether it's ethical to send this Borg in to uh, kill all the other Borg. Basically, like, you know, it's a war crime in any other circumstance. Uh, but they, they say, you know, they're, they're, they have a right to do it because their existence is threatened. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, the, that's the thrust of this episode. In the end, they realize that uh, this Borg 
has attained individuality. Mm-hmm. Some really amazing scenes, some amazing acting and writing all throughout, man. I love this episode. Yeah, it's a great episode. I, watching these episodes and watching as much TNG as I have, I feel like they really have done a good job in crafting the Picard series because these episodes we're watching that we think are going to be important to the show are mm-hmm. all great. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it's like they went back like, what are the best episodes of TNG? Uh, let's smush those into the Picard series. Let's like, make sure we call out all the best shit. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, I think that's exactly what they're doing. And if you're going to do a Picard series, uh, you you want to touch on the Borg. Oh yeah, you want to you know hit up the Romulan stuff because there was there was a fair amount of Picard's dealings with the Romulans. Yes, as far as like you know, uh, he was like the first captain to to meet up with him after eighty years or whatever. Right, and he worked with Spock um, uh, in the he episode with we Spock, talked last yeah. year, Unification. And, uh, of, and of course, you want to talk about his relationship with Data, which they went pretty deep on in every ep- every every movie, particularly, and a lot of episodes. You know, well, that's just because Data was like the second most popular character. Sure. If sure. not the most popular character. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's true. I think it's true. And, and that's – so even though the series is called Picard, I think a big selling point for bringing it back is the fact that we're going to get Data again. Mm-hmm. Though I'm – less and less excited about that really yeah i don't know that i'm excited for data as much as i am i'm really excited for the storyline that seems to be developing with the lots of lots of different androids uh that are being serving the federation Mm-hmm. that's pretty interesting to me yeah what what is not exciting you about the data stuff um their lack of remembering or being able to look at old footage to find out where his hairline was supposed to be for one thing. It just bothers me so much. I hear you. I hear you. I know that's a thing that bothers you. I, I don't, it doesn't bother me. And I, I know a lot of people were passing around that meme around the, around the internet where you can tell his hairline is in one place when he's turned around and then he turns back around his hairline's in a different place. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that's all trailer stuff too. They may fix a lot of that. In, they might. Uh, obviously, they're doing some post work on his hair, so <laughs> they might be. They they may just not have fixed some of those shots yet. I know. It's just you know, this is, it's going to be one of my little hangups that I'm going to have to try to deal with and move on with, <laughs> uh, from. I hear you. Uh, I hear you. Well, let's dive uh, get back to Iborg. Um, yeah, we've got. You know, the the main thrust of this episode is Picard is angry. He's an uh, angry, angry man. He hates the Borg. And yep. and so does everyone else. Guinan is the conscience of this show in many ways. Mm-hmm. And she is like, "What are you doing?" She she's basically fully advocating the 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 genocide of the Borg. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's so fascinating that they have to kind of and you know she is so often the character who talks to Picard and convinces him to do the right thing. And in this particular situation, because she is the character that her entire species was eradicated by the Borg. Uh, she's not, she's not wanting to save the Borg. She hates the Borg as much as anyone, which makes it that much more important when she comes to Picard later and says, no, you need to go talk to him. Yeah. If you don't talk to him, you will regret it. Is, is, is basically her message to him. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. How, how much did you love? Speaking of how everyone being angry with the Borg, uh, how much do you love like <laughs> Worf on the planet just going kill it now, make it appear that it died in the crash? Like what yep. the hell? What the hell, Worf? Oh, and in that moment, that's <laughs> the moment that Picard says, "Bring it back." Which, when I was watching that at first, he has a face that, it, that sort of flashes across his face that says, "Oh, I'm not going to be that guy. We're not going to be the type of we're no, we, that's not the, what the Federation does." So leaving it there is the same thing. It looks like the flash across his face is him realizing uh, we have to do the humanitarian thing here. But then mm-hmm. you find out that's not the flash that went across his face at all. The flash that went across his face was his realization that he could genocide the Borg if he used this, used this young Borg to destroy all of its people. Yeah. Do you, let me ask you this. Do you, do you think they should have done it? Whew, man. <laughs> because I'll be honest, I think they should have. Like, I love the Roddenberry ideal, but no, they should have done it. 
<laughs> right. I, I respect that opinion, but here's the problem with it. Picard is so right on, like he stays away for a reason. Because I think if you have the dispassionate look at what's going on, Mm -hmm. the thing you have to do is stop the Borg. And if you're Mm -hmm. making... This this is exactly an example, and I think we're going to get this in the Picard series. We're going to find out what the result of this is. Uh, The next episode we're covering in this Picard primer is Descent, which we're going to find out even more about what happens with Hugh. Uh, But uh, in the Picard show, we're going to find out the real ramifications of this decision. And I think the, 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 what I, what I love about this is they're, they're making an overarching point that it's taken them 30 years to tell. And I love it because what they're saying is, yeah, we could have immediately killed the Borg. We had the Mm -hmm. opportunity to immediately kill the Borg in that moment. But what happens if instead you show compassion and you stay by your ideals and yeah, we, we had the war continued for however long, I guess, until right. Janeway did her thing. But like, because of that, some of these beings were salvaged because of the decisions they made in this episode. It looks like in the, in the future, in the card series, Hugh has some sort of, you know, team of ex Borg that he's working with that are now allies to the Federation. Mm hmm. Maybe their plan would have worked. Maybe it wouldn't have, you know, and it would have just shown the Borg more how you like what they did in in teaching a Borg about individuality and the importance of uh, interpersonal communication, basically friendship. Um, they taught that to Hugh and then that's the virus they sent back. I love I love that idea. And yeah, I'm with you. I think like. I don't think I would have made that decision. I probably would have made the decision to do it. Uh huh. But you can't do that once you know that Hugh is an individual. You, that's, that's, it's very much against the Federation's ideals once you know that Hugh is an individual. Now you could go all, uh, Section 31 and do it anyway. Uh huh. Like protect the Federation despite its ideals. Mm hmm. But that's not who Picard is. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I, I legitimately don't know what I would have done. I mean, I think. I think I probably would have been the more the, lean, the more like Section Thirty One way, the sort of I, pragmatist yeah. way, honestly. But that's that's why we watch this series. We watch this series because Picard is our example of someone trying to do better. You know, mm-hmm. oh, I just freaking love it. <laughs> and I, I love though that he's, he's trying to do better. So is everyone on this ship. They're trying to do better, but they all hate the Borg. And as they have actual interpersonal interaction with him, they realize they can't use him for that purpose. And I think that's so important. I think that's actually like a big issue with our, our like society right now is that we don't, we no longer look each other in the face almost at all because of the way we can communicate with computers. And so it's really hard to get next to someone you don't agree with and just see them for as a human being, it's really easy to vilify everyone who has differences than you. Um, we thought the you know, internet would bring the world together, but instead it's pushed us into our corners and, and made everyone kind of hateful. And, and this episode yeah. is all about you hate that person, but what if you actually go and have a conversation with them? Yeah. That's all it is, man. Uh, uh, freaking love it. I yeah, freaking love that's it. Great. That, that's what I wrote my song about this week, by the way. It's, it's that concept. And it's, it's one of the more Star Trek heavy songs. And I really, really like the song. It, it actually, it's meaningful to me. Um, I like it a lot. Nice. And we're playing it at the end of this episode, yeah, right? That's right. It'll be at the end of this episode. So cool. hope you guys like it. It is a good song. Thanks, man. Thank you. Real earworm. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so let's see what else we got. I like Guinan. I always like Guinan. I just, I need more Guinan. I wish mm-hmm. they'd make a Star Trek Guinan. Um, yeah. I would watch that show. I would absolutely watch that show. But <laughs> I, I had a dream. I had a dream that they did that. They, we were really excited that they were going to make a Star Trek Guinan. And we were finally going to find out like about her backstory a lot more. And like, the true nature of her. But for some reason, because it's Alex Kurtzman, they decided to start calling it Jinan. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just so beside ourselves. And you were like, I could take aesthetic changes, but this is just ridiculous. This is too far. <laughs> the line must be drawn here. 
this far, no further. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I liked her little sword trick she pulls in the fencing room mm-hmm. where she says, you you felt mercy on me and look what it got you. She pretends to be hurt and allows uh, Picard to drop his guard and then she stabs him while fencing. And it's, it's a fun... That's a fun moment. Um, she's just really going all in on, you need to kill this freaking Borg. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, also, yeah. I also found it, um, say, let's talk about some controversial shit here. Uh, oh, no. I found the way the Borg, the way that Hugh, or third mm-hmm. or five, as he's known at this point in the episode, when he's talking about assimilation. Yeah. I found it very interesting because he doesn't find assimilation to be a bad thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I, I think it's like just all he knows at this point. Yes, but he also like well in this moment he knows his individuality in this moment that he's he's alone mm-hmm. and he feels lonely. He's so lonely, right. and he's like, "Why would you want to stay here? It's so quiet here. It's silent. There's no other voices." Yeah. Um, and, and Jordy's like, that's what we, 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 we value that. I value that there's no other voices and, and I value my own individuality and Hugh doesn't understand that. And also Hugh legitimately feels like assimilating people into this collective and letting them be a part of this collective voice is what they, what they should want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He, he's, he's a missionary in his mind. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I was watching this and I was getting like big vibes of like religion, honestly. Interesting. <laughs> like uh the Borg the Borg think they're missionaries out to save the galaxy. You know, you you will become a part of this collective that will uh will you'll you'll be better off for it. And the people outside of that collective are just like, "No, no, no. I I am who I am and I don't want to be a part of your thing. And the board's like, no, that's, you will be assimilated and you will like it. Resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, to be fair, most of, it seems like people do like it. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it does. It does. The, the, the Borg who are Borgified turn into missionaries too. Like, I don't know. I know that that's sort of a weird way to correlate the Borg to, uh, a religion but i kind of see it i I definitely saw that they were drawing that parallel it, it may be unintentionally i don't know i mean as you know i could see that being a roddenberry thing oh yeah for sure you know just like oh look here's you know a bunch of jehovah's witness in a cube yeah uh, precisely on your door precisely that's uh <laughs> like they i was uh when i start when i sat down to write this song for this week um i om- i had a really hard time writing it because i kept basically writing uh drive by incubus <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> which is about re- refusing to be part of the hive um mm-hmm. and it, it it's such a it's such a borg song and i never realized it until i tried to write a borg song and i was like oh it's impossible. Often times when I have an idea and I try to write it and it's kind of been done before, I can't get past it. I'm like, there's no way I can do better than that, that version of this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. And that song is about religion. And so it is just the correlation was there for me. I don't know. Yeah, I can see it. Does it, does it, does it disturb you that Jordy can't seem to make friends who aren't robots <laughs> or technology of some Whatever. sort? Whatever. Like, He's good friends with Guinan. Kind of. I think that Jordy's just more open-minded than most. Or maybe lonelier than most. He's a nerd, man. He's the only guy in the future that wears glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... I don't know. Like, why are you being such a dick to Reg Barkley in the in the show? Because oh yeah, him and Reg. Uh, well, no, it's that's self hating nerds right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just that really that initial episode. He's nice to Reg after that, but yeah. Oh my gosh! Like, <sighs> no, you're right. He does he does make friends with technology, but I do think that I think he's a nerd, like just through and through. He's a nerd. He is. I love when Guinan asked him, you named the Borg? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just love that. I loved it so much. (laughs) Uh, 
he does sell it. He's he's so good. I love I love LeVar Burton. Yeah, me too, man. I I really hope he makes it onto Picard, if not this season, another season. I do too. I don't think there's a week goes by where me or my wife doesn't say something about it. you. Don't have to take my word for it. And we both go, but don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, anyway. All right. So uh, we'll uh, other things, other cool scenes in this episode. Uh, when Guinan meets the Borg, uh, she talks about the destruction of her people. She goes in all angry. It's that same yeah. thing I've been talking about. You know, she she has a moment to actually meet him face to face and realizes he's a, just a person trying to do the mm-hmm. best he can with the with the upbringing and the way that he's been brought into this world and the way he's been taught. And he says, she tells him about the destruction of her people, and he says, "You are lonely." And then, because that's that's a word that Jordy taught him, mm-hmm. and then she just is really taken aback by that. And then he says, "We are lonely," and it's the freaking best man. It's just yeah, so it good. And then the other person who also hates him so much, and then gets a chance to meet him is the is Picard, of course. Mm-hmm. And when Picard finally does get to meet him face to face, Hugh assumes that he's Lacutus because he he would, and. He he actually uses his position as Locutus of Borg to uh, try to convince Hugh to assimilate the Enterprise and assimilate Geordi specifically, mm-hmm. and Hugh just refuses. And it's it's a beautiful beautiful thing. And and then and then the next scene is even even more beautiful when he decides to go back to the Collective and give up the individuality he has gained uh, just so that he can protect Geordi, basically. Yeah. Oh, it's such a great episode. That's rough. It's real rough. He says, I don't want to forget that I am Hugh. Uh. I'm so excited they put him into the series. Like, there's so many too. fan favorites they could have brought back. You know? Like, we're talking about, we're talking about Jordy. You know? Like, they easily yeah. could have bring Jordy into there. And maybe they will. But the fact that they brought in Hugh and he's already been in the trailers, like, that excites me more than probably any of the other characters would. Because the other characters are going to be fan service. But Hugh seems like the kind of story they want to tell. And that's real cool. Absolutely. And there, you know, there are certain things, like, that keep TNG from being one of my, uh, my in my top tier. Like, and it's, you know, it's mid-range, but... The just the lack of like there's so many threads that they opened and then it just never came back to because oh we have to beat the law and order of of sci-fi yeah um everything has to be episodic which that was the the way back in the day you know I and understand I I, th- I felt that way too but rewatching it I'm feeling less and less like it's so disconnected there's so many cool little connections like this i mean and like yeah. i said next week we're watching descent for next week's episode and descent is about hugh and what happens to him after after this uh, events of this episode there there are more than like when i rewatched it a few years ago there were a lot more than i remembered and i was pretty pleased with even the character development on the show yeah, um, interesting. Now, it, it's not nearly as deep as DS Nine. No, no, for surely, but, for sure not. But it, 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 it is there. They are trying to do some things, and I'm, I'm more excited than I thought I'd be to rewatch this show. Mm-hmm. Um, did you catch the wonderful, wonderful reworded spot quote? Um, which one was that? I love it. Favorite quote of the episode, probably when they when they try to get Hugh to. Uh, he, they, they offer him asylum. They say, you can uh-huh. stay here. We just need to know what you want. If you want to stay here, we'll offer you asylum and you can stay here. And he says, you are many. I am one. What I want doesn't matter. Mm. Oh, it's sacrificial, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's actually making me choked up to think about that Borg with just like, he's just, he's sacrificing himself to save his friends. <sighs> Yeah. It's so good, man. It's so good. It is good. Uh, and the last thing he says as he's going away from Jordy, he says, goodbye, Jordy. I will try to remember you. That's great. I, I like, since we're getting Hugh, it makes me want Jordy all the more. Like, I really, mm-hmm. really would love to see a scene of, like, I can't just... The idea that the Borg could have been humanized to the point 
where we're going to, we would care about the meeting of 30 years later, Jordy and Hugh Mm -hmm. is so exciting to me. The Star Trek has always been about pushing the boundaries of the Federation, meeting new people, wars breaking out, and then slowly learning to live side by side together. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Klingons, the Romulans, um, the Dominion, the Cardassians, all these, all these different people like that. You, you go, you, they, they go to war because you, you, you run out into each other out in the galaxy and you have these battles and the Borg were this thing that like, no, you can't, they can't be reasoned with. This is beyond our ability to reason with this thing. And I love the fact that this, this series that's coming out 30 years later is going to be, maybe we can, you know, <laughs> maybe we can yeah. figure out how to live at peace with the Borg. Maybe it is possible to teach them about our culture and actually have a cultural exchange and live in peace. Just, just I, excites I, me, man. Yeah, I do wonder if, if they're heading in a direction of like, I, I don't know, like uh, people being able to choose whether they want to be assimilated or not. Ooh, that's interesting. That's like some Black Mirror shit. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, I could have, that's a really good question. Like, it would make sense that there would be people who would want to be a part of a collective. For sure. Like, for sure. You know, like people who grew up in big families. Yeah. You know, yeah. They don't I, like that quiet. They want to hear constant bickering and hatred and self loathing. It's just, it's just a question of what is the purpose of the Borg if not to conquer the galaxy, you know? Well,. You know, you say that though, but you know when the queen was in first contact talks about um, how they believe that organic beings need to ev- evolve to include the synthetic. So, why does that necessarily have to be a power play? Well, it just is is currently is all I'm saying. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it will become, and it, it definitely doesn't have to be. Uh, to to be to have the synthetic worked in, but the way they have uh, that way they have been up till now is every society will be assimilated, and we're just gonna you know, right? It, 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 we we will take everything, and eventually the entire universe will be just the board collective. But like yeah, everything that they have said, that the all of their motives, you know, to to evolve to, uh, you know, uh add biological and technological distinctiveness to their own. Mm-hmm. None of that, none of that means that you have to take over the freaking galaxy. No, but you know what it kind of reminds me of the way that we talk, the way that the Federation talks about the board collective reminds me of the way that in the discovery timeline, uh, discovery time period, mud is talking about the Federation. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's the question is like, what is the difference? You know, you're sitting here talking about adding technological and cultural distinctiveness to our own or biological technical distinctiveness. Like that's very much what the Federation is doing. They're going you from know, planet to planet and, and they've just met someone who's kind of better at it than they are, but uh-huh. in, in a, in a, in a, in a way that they don't want to be a part of. And it's kind of like what the Bajorans or, Whatever the Bajorans pushing back on the Federation is very similar to the Federation pushing back on the Borg. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and there there could be arguably a better understanding and a better chance for peace if we were all linked in a hive mind. Oh, for sure. And but then I what think, is peace? That then that's that's the, yeah. qu- the question is balancing the rights of the individual versus. Uh, because that's the thing, if if they had may forced you, if they forced you to do a uh, genocide on his own people, they are making the same kind of decisions the collective makes about individuals. That the individual mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You can't sit there and say the reason we're resisting the hive is because individuals matter, and then go, but also, uh, you know, y- you can you can take care of this one individual, you know, (laughs) like let this one individual die. It's that individual has to make that decision. And that's what happens. He chooses to sacrifice himself. It's not a decision made by the Federation. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking, I'm just playing around with with the concept of the Borg because, you know, 
you could take it so many different ways. Like there was, um, when I was watching this episode, I was thinking about how the Borg, uh, in the Picard series coming up could be seen as a, um, as a metaphor for the trans community. Like you have the Federation who's like very stodgy and against it. And they think that there's like taking over the galaxy. And then, but once you, you know, meet someone who's transitioning, you're like, Oh, you're just a person, you know, and you're, you're not just trying to assimilate our lifestyle. You're just trying to find a place for yourself. It's interesting. You bring up trans. I think it's because I think that there's such a small number the, mm-hmm. the, the idea about the Borg is they're just like a sweeping. I think it kind of works the opposite way that it's like, uh, as I said, I think it's like the religious types uh, sort of wanting to assimilate everyone into their way of thinking and the individuals are trying to do something different. I think it's a good analog for anyone who hates anyone. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess specifically I was thinking about like, because I, I don't know how how deep it goes and how how much Janeway hurt the Borg. We were led to believe that it, it was quite a bit at the end of Voyager. But if the Borg are like a severe minority at this point. Sure. In the Picard timeline. Sure, sure, sure. That's a good point. In the Picard time period, it could be that because of the destruction that Janeway wrought upon the Borg, that they are a small minority that the Federation wants to wipe out and they're doing everything they can to survive. And it becomes more of a sort of like uh, small pockets of guerrilla terrorist Borg trying to just like have let the collective survive. And what if you, what if the story of Picard is Picard trying to fight for the rights of the Borg? Yeah. Ooh, that would be a turn. I mean, that's, that's Kittimer, man. That's, that's, Kirk trying to fight to save the peace treaty with the Klingons, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Loving it. I'm loving it. I'm so pumped, man. So pumped. I think we need to get to (laughs) quotes and trivia. You got got any quotes? I I, I, I did write down, kill it now, make it appear that it died in the crash from war. Yeah, I've already read Um, all mine while we were talking about the episode. Um. I loved Crusher. We didn't really talk about Crusher too much. Oh, yeah. She's very much the conscience. She's the one person on the side of the Borg from the beginning. Yeah, stalwart voice in in favor of uh, humanitarian action. And uh, I I love when she goes, infect it, you make it sound as if it's a disease. And, like, Patrick Stewart plays it so well, and he just, like, just steely-eyed, straight through her soul. Quite right, Doctor. If all goes well, a terminal one. Like, oh, you're just, you could do so good. So good things. Ah, Yep, really good. (laughs) Destroys the language centers of my brain. Patrick Stewart is so good. <laughs> the the quote that I had written down from her earlier, I, for, I deleted it, but it was something to the effect of, he says, you know, uh, the Borg, the Borg are, you know, there, there is no, there is no individual. They're a hive mind with, with no care. Da, 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 da. And she's like, how convenient. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. Ooh, yep, yeah, it is. It is real convenient. Isn't it? I can't, I just can't believe this early on in the, just, sort of discovery of the Borg and who they are, that they were already playing with these ideas of, in my memory, and, and I guess it's from some of the books I've read and especially and Voyager, the Borg are the threat that's after us. They're sort of, the, they're the zombies of Star Trek. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they very much are that, but this is only like the third or fourth Borg episode and they're already playing with the ideas of, yeah, but are they? You know, mm-hmm. should we be trying for peace with these people? Are is it possible for them to gain individuality and make good decisions? And I just love that they were already going there at this point. Yeah, I feel like they kind of lost that when you go to Voyager, with the exception of Seven of Nine, which is removed from the collective deliberately, and it's and different. all of those Borg children, right? And yeah, the other colonies of individualized former Borg. Actually, actually, they did do quite a bit. Did they do it quite a bit? See, I don't remember that quite a bit. I remember a couple episodes, but I, I guess I, I plan to rewatch uh, mm-hmm. soon. Soon. Yeah. I. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, I I love the um, Jordy trying to get Guinan to go see Hugh and why don't you go talk to him if it's, it might not be so clear cut and she says because I wouldn't have anything to say then why don't you just listen 
That is what you do best, isn't it? Like, boom, mic drop. Boom, bartender. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I love when Guinan tells Picard, if you're going to use this person, and he just breaks and screams, it's not a person, damn it, it's a Borg. Like, ah, yeah, yep. that's that's a little piece of first contact. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, the anger's under the surface all throughout this. And I love that, yeah, yes, a black woman in his ready room telling him to, you know, telling him to do something <laughs> different with the board, and, he's, and he yells in a very similar manner. That is pretty funny. Um, no, yeah, but when he said, when, I, loved, I loved how she responds. He's like, it's not a person, it's a Borg. And she just, like, very calmly resets and said, this person... When you do this, like, it's like, oh, shit, just ignored your outburst, Captain. <laughs> you know, if I, I, I loved Alfre Woodard in, in First Contact, but for the purposes of continuity, I wish it had been Guinan. Hmm. Like, I wish it had just been her, like, following through, because, like, her, she and Picard are so tied to the Borg throughout. Yeah. TNG, it would just been awesome if she was like Picard's conscience in that in that movie as well. Yeah, it'd be nice, but I do really like I like Alfred Woodard for sure, and I love I love that it's someone from a different time who doesn't understand what's going on. But I, I do think it gives it weight when it's Guinan who does know what's going on and hates mm-hmm. the Borg for what they've done, and she's still doing that. I yeah, it's oh man, it would have been nice. Would have been nice. Do you have any other quotes? Um, not that we haven't already mentioned, no. Okay. What do you got for trivia? Um, all right. So this all comes from Memory Alpha. Uh, after the success of Best of Both Worlds, the writing staff uh, had been trying to find a way to bring the board back. They were facing the problem of how to follow up um, with an enemy that was only barely escaped in at the you know in the first point, and. Ronald D. Moore says, I think this is a real good way to bring the Borg back because they're very limiting in the way they are. They're this huge collective with no voice to communicate uh, to, and you can't relate to these guys. We keep saying they're unstoppable if we keep stopping them. It undercuts how unstoppable they truly are. And I I agree with that. Oh, yeah. Um, Now, the title of the episode is an allusion to Isaac Asimov's book, I, Robot. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I did not catch that, but yeah. And uh, it was in turn a reference to Robert Graves' book, I, Claudius. It is also a, a pun on the word cyborg. I, Borg, cyborg. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Del Arco, the guy that played Hugh, was a fan of the original series growing up and pretty much jumped at the, uh, jumped at the chance to be on there. He actually auditioned to be Wesley Crusher. Oh, funny. Um. And when it was given to Will Wheaton, he was so disappointed he refused to watch the show Aww. until until he got the chance to be on it. <laughs> well, don't worry. Now people like you more. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> in your in your two appearances on Star Trek, I don't Trek. know. <laughs> I don't know. I, th- I feel like everybody likes Will Wheaton a whole lot now. Uh, no, I think that Will Wheaton just has some fame now because <laughs> they, like, well, he he's been embraced at the geek community as a geek, but not as Wesley Crusher. Like people like Will Wheaton. They don't like Wesley Crusher, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. people kind of despise Wesley Crusher. And I, I, what I didn't realize, one of the things rewatching this show I've realized is that Wesley Crusher was kind of the main character at first, like not fully, but like they do a lot of episodes where he's the hero in season one. Yeah, that was one of the big downfalls of season one for me is that like every episode is like the genius kid saves the ship and everybody else is inept. Yep. I think they were trying to target younger viewers by having a young character doing things on the ship that were like really impressive. But almost every episode ends with like him getting commendations for doing something amazing on that episode. It was like, man, they are pushing Wesley hard. They're pushing Mm -hmm. that kid. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't work because we were mostly, even as, I don't know, as a kid, I didn't care about Wesley. I like, you know, I didn't hate him uh, as I kind of do now, uh, but I, I, I wasn't connecting with him. I was connecting with Data and Jordy, you know? You don't have to have a kid to connect to kids. Mm-hmm. Not how it works. I agree. Let's see. Uh, oh, Jonathan Del- Delarco uh, joked that before he took the job a friend warned him that he would be asked about it for years afterwards and that actually that proved to be absolutely true oh yeah he really is a memorable part of the series 
Yeah. Like I weirdly. Yeah. How many characters are in one or two episodes that you remember their name? But like, well, okay, maybe me and you, that's more, especially you. There's not that many that I remember from when I was a kid. Like, a lot of that has been reinforced by talking. But I remember Hugh. Hugh Hugh was a big part of what I liked about the show when I was a child. And I still remember mm-hmm. liking it, that episode so much. Yeah. Oh, Hugh uses the pronoun I really early on in the episode. Oh, when he asks When he asks Crusher in the Forge, do I have a name? Oh, yeah. That's true. And uh, I can't say this guy's name, Renee Echeverria, I'll say, acknowledged it. He says, uh, much to his embarrassment, <laughs> um, he, he realized it happened. And he went to Jerry Taylor and because he had caught the error in the script. And they were like, oh, the scene's already been filmed. Oh, no. <laughs> um. I don't know if you noticed, but this is the first time that they've uh, designated that the Borg have numbers, like third of five. But unlike the later iterations, he says third of five, not three of five. Yeah, I wondered about that. Interesting. Mm hmm. Jerry Taylor, who uh, did an uncredited polish on the script, said that this episode meant that we can never treat the Borg the same way again. Yeah, for sure. And I kind of disagree. Uh, they did do treat the Borg the same way again in, in First Contact. Yes, they do. They do. They do a lot. And I mean, I, there's a, there is a difference when you have the chance to give humanitarian aid to someone mm-hmm. and when they are trying to kill you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I guess that there's a, there's a there's a bit of truth to that because but they don't ever like treat it with the same kind of mystery for sure. Hmm. They yeah. don't ever treat the Borg with the same level of ominous mystery. Yeah. And I, I think that's somewhat to the detriment of the Borg. As, as, a, as a villain, as the show's villain? That's a point of interest. Right. Not even as a villain. Like I guess unless they go all the way with it, which is what it seems like they might be doing with in the Picard series, is like we'll just see. going all the way with like building a new culture of these possibly freed borg i mean i lamented the uh the mystification of the borg but you would have thought i was at a rock concert when i saw jerry ryan pop up in that tra- picard trailer at the first time <laughs> yeah people love seven nine people love voyager uh we are in the minority on that most star trek fans really like voyager and don't really like ds9 uh i don't know it's, it's one of those things i think there's a i think over time maybe that divide has shrunk i think there's a lot of people who love ds9 now who've maybe gone back and watched it because it was just so different when it came on that a lot of people didn't give it the chance. And Voyager was like, hey, look, it's another show about going around the galaxy. <laughs> we were going, well, on first run, Voyager steadily lost tons of, of viewers. And the, it was a very negative time towards Voyager. And it was only subsequently that, like, as I got older, I found people who were younger than we were had been watching the reruns of Voyager and had really glommed onto it. You know, I think it's partially because it's exactly the reason we don't like it because of the lack of serialization and uh, and lack of connectivity and lack of character development is exactly why it works well in syndication and why mm-hmm. a set a, like a, a after school afternoon slot it works really well. Yeah, and so yeah, it makes sense that a lot of like younger people. Yeah, that's the thing I've experienced too. People that are like a few years younger than me love Voyager, and and maybe even on the same level as TNG for them, it's just the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's just another Star Trek show. That's that's Star Trek to them. And yeah. to me, DS Nine was like an evolution of Star Trek, and it, it, it then they what what's so disappointing about Voyager for me is that they immediately go back to the same well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Pillar says that not all fans were as enthused with the episode as he was. Uh, there were some people who really felt that Iborg betrayed the vision of the Borg because it humanized them more than they wanted to see. But I just think every time you can understand understand your enemy, those stories have a huge impact. Hmm. I, I both agree and don't agree. I think it makes makes it lessens their status as a villain. But you know, understanding a character more can be more interesting for sure. Mm-hmm. He al- he also said he he said that this episode was quote everything I want Star Trek to be. Hmm. 
He says, I think it's just a great premise, which forces both Guinan and Picard to confront their own prejudices. And you would think these two are, these are two characters who have none. But when it comes to the Borg, the old issue is know your enemy. It's a lot harder to hate them if you know them. And it deals with the issue of what happens to these communal Borg, which cannot be treated as anything else but parts of the whole when one is separated and becomes an individual. I feel that if you take the unstoppable villain, the stereotype, and you turn it inside out, that's great dramatic storytelling. Man, I think that is a perfect lead-in to my song this week. Yeah, it is. It is a perfect lead-in to my song this week. So, uh, we're going to do that. Uh, we're, we're the Star Trek Universe podcast. Uh, find us all the places. Uh, but first, check out this brand new song from my band, The Garage, uh, which has literally just been me here in my office writing music. But uh, I, this is a Star Trek song. It is about Iborg, and it's about specifically that concept. So mm-hmm. uh, hope you dig it. It's a monster, not a man. I've seen what they do. Don't be deceived, because you're calling it Hugh. I've seen the inside of that particular hive, so I know It's not with fear that I sing, I've just felt their sting They replaced all I am with brutality Now you present me with this horror, and tell me it's a boy far from home It's hard to hate your enemy when you let them get so close And hate's a steady guy, post oh, it keeps you on the road The road that you've decided on When you're damn sure you know what's best Some say love your enemy They haven't met mine There's nothing to redeem Behind those cold eyes I know there's no love nor trust Cause I was once just like them Oh, it's hard to hate your enemy When you let them get so close And hate's a steady guy Post oh, it keeps you on the road The road that you've decided on When you're damn sure you know what's best out to us, hit us up at StarTrekUCast.com, at StarTrekUCast on Twitter, or search for the Star Trek Universe Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. And if you want to hear more from David C. Robertson, search for the DC On Screen Podcast in your podcast app now, or go to Maladjusted.tv for his comedy sketches. If you want to hear more from me, Matthew Carroll, search for the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or the Orville Universe Podcast in your podcast app, or check out my music. Just search for Matthew Carroll wherever you listen to music. 